Praise the Lord. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I do want to thank you for this evening and for the opportunity to look at your word. Lord, I do ask you to guide our steps and direct our paths through your word. We ask you for your truth tonight. We don't want simple opinions. We don't want uh, casual observations, but we really want the truth. So we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us. We thank you for the anointing that destroys the yoke, and we thank you that you record this for future reference to be a blessing to the, to the generations yet to come. Father, we just ask you to have your way to do your work, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Of course, we're looking at this series on homosexuality in the Bible, or everything you always uh, suspected was true but were afraid to ask. And um, uh, we have already looked at uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Leviticus, 1 Timothy, 1 Corinthians, and now tonight we're going to look at uh, Kadesh is the, uh, the word we're going to look at. And a, a, simple, a simple little uh, word. And we would not be even looking at this word. We wouldn't even be um, bothering with it. We wouldn't even be bothering looking at these scriptures in this particular topic, except that uh, in one translation, and in one translation alone, this word gets translated as sodomite. And if this word were not translated as sodomite in the King James Version, we would never even uh, pick this up as a possible topic to look at. But over the years, of course, the word sodomite, and uh, uh, we get much of our American law from British law, and uh, so as England had made laws in the 1600s and the 1500s and earlier dates than that, we pick up on a lot of those things. And so since the King James Version, written in 1611, translates this one word as sodomite, then we end up with that word uh, being translated in, here in America, and our lawmakers pick up on that. And so much of what's considered sodomy, or what is uh, considered uh, the sodomy laws in America, are often uh, referred back to, to these particular passages. And yet, no modern translation translates this word sodomy. And they do have, a, they do have a, uh, many good translations. NIV is a good translation. New American Standard are good translations. And they do retranslate this word. Uh, before we look at the passages in question, the passages that people have looked at, I do want to um, make mention of some more reference material. This little book doesn't have anything on the front or the back, but on the side, uh, it's called the New Englishman's Hebrew Concordance. New Englishman's Hebrew Concordance. And this particular concordance is coded with Strong's. Remember, we've talked already about Strong's concordance. So this Hebrew concordance, there is the New Englishman's Hebrew concordance. That's the one we're looking at tonight. Also, there is the New Englishman's Greek concordance. So obviously, this one book uh, goes along with every, just like Strong's, goes along with every word that's in the Bible uh, based on the King James Version. This one goes along with every word in the Bible in the, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew concordance. The advantage of this particular book and where this is helpful when we're looking at passages like we're looking at tonight, if you know what the word is in English that you want to look at in a particular passage, you look in the Strong's concordance and when you, uh, when you come across the, let's say you wanted to look at the word sodomite. And so in, um, in, uh, in the word sodomite, you would look up, uh, that in Strong's, and it would tell you places that the word sodomite is at, and every passage that uses the word sodomite. However, if the word for sodomite is translated, if that particular Hebrew word is translated to be anything else, you'd have no way of knowing uh, where else is this word used. We found this out when we were studying God's government, uh, when it came time to looking up pastor. For instance, the word pastor, if you look up uh, uh, Strong's Concordance, is only translated once in the entire Bible. And it looks like the word pastor doesn't show up anywhere else in the Bible. But the word is actually shepherd. And if you know the number in Strong's, in this book, uh, you would look up the number, that the Strong's number. It's coded with Strong's. And then it shows you every single place that that word is used and what that word is translated into. So therefore, it becomes a very helpful tool, especially when you want to find out, uh, you know, in Hebrew, 
how else is this word used? Or in the, uh, the Greek concordance, how else is that word used? So that's how we found out what a pastor was, was a shepherd, and how it got translated as overseer and bishop, etc. And so in this case, uh, it's, very pro it's very productive. Another one I want to show you, uh, we have mentioned this one before, but this is the interlinear Bible. And it's Hebrew, Greek, and English, and uh, it's actually written in the Old Testament. It's actually just written right there in Hebrew for you. And then above the Hebrew word is the Strong's Concordance number. So you can look word for word for word and find out actually what is the Strong's number. And below it is an English translation. So uh, you don't actually read this Bible ever in English. You're reading it in Greek or you're reading it in Hebrew. And though you can't read Hebrew or Greek, you can see the word and, you can, and there's a, a, a side column that has a translation alongside. So you can figure out where it is. So when we're looking for a particular word, there are lots of Bible helps that let us know what it is that we're looking at. And these are ways that we find out what the Bible really is saying because it wasn't written in English because the English language didn't exist. Um, another book I want to show you that is not particularly dealing with tonight's topic of this word Kadesh, but I have just discovered this book and I really want to uh, make note of this book. This book's written by a man by the name of Bruce Hilton and it's called Can Homophobia Be Cured? And the author of this book is a heterosexual man uh, married uh, to his wife. They are both members of the Methodist Church. And uh, he is, he's, much of what he deals with is, uh, is uh, from the perspective of the Methodist Church. Of course, within Methodism, there are new churches uh, springing up that are uh, calling themselves reconciling congregations. And so they've been grappling with the question of homosexuality. And I think Bruce Hilton's book puts a good, uh, a good grasp on the question from a hetero perspective, heterosexual perspective, how, um, how does God look at this? Can gay folks be a part of the church? Should they be a part of the church? Should they be ordained? What about their relationships? Uh, asking lots and lots of questions, and it's put in a very simple question, answer, question, answer kind of format. And in the, in the index, uh, it gives you lots and lots of those questions. It's just a simple little paperback. It wouldn't be that expensive to buy, put out by Abington Press. And so I think uh, if you have heterosexual friends uh, who are grappling with the question, it's not deep into scripture. Uh, it doesn't look at all the scriptural references that we do, but it does touch upon some of them. It looks at the Sodom and Gomorrah story, looks at some of uh, the Romans 1, a few other uh, of the major issues, but it doesn't really you know, go into depth. It certainly is not going to cover tonight's question because, as I said, tonight's question wouldn't even be a question had it not been translated in King James as sodomite. So we're going to look at this word. Um, first of all, we're going to look at the, the first passage that's of any importance. The first time this word shows up, this word shows up, uh, there, there are two words actually. One is the male version of the word and the other is the female version of the word. Um, 6945 in Strong's is the male version of this word. That's the word that gets translated as sodomite. 6948 in Strong's is the female version of the word and uh, of Kadesh, and it's the uh, Kadesha, and it is, uh, uh, it doesn't get translated, of course, as sodomite s or anything else. It just, uh, just usually is a harlot or whore or something along those kinds of lines. But it doesn't mean uh, harlot, it doesn't mean uh, prostitute or whore, it has a very specific connotation. And so we're going to begin to look at that. Tonight we're going to first turn to Deuteronomy chapter 23, and uh, because this particular passage in verse 17 and 18 uses both words, the male and the female, and we get a little sense of what they're talking about here. We remember it, the, Deuteron the book of Deuteronomy is a book written by Moses that gives us some instruction to the new nation of Israel as they're going into the promised land and on their way to the promised land while they're still in the wilderness as the law is being given to them. And uh, much of what this word is, uh, this instruction in Deuteronomy as well as Leviticus is uh, setting up their national laws and the things that make them separate, a separated people from the people around them and the people that they're going in uh, to take their land. So in Deuteronomy 23 verse 17, here are the two words. We see them both in this passage. It says, there shall be, now I'm going to read from King James, 
There shall be no whore, it says, and that's 6948 in Strong's, of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite, 6945, of the sons of Israel. Now, interestingly enough, since I said this is the, uh, the male and female version of the same word, it's, uh, it's intriguing because the word whore and the word sodomite imply completely different uh, connotations. And to simply say that there shall be no whore or there shall be no uh, uh, sodomite in the nation of Israel implies that there are just some things you're just not going to do um, if you're a good Jewish uh, person in covenant with God in the Old Testament. But that's not what the word means. I want to read you from uh, Spiro Zodiades lexicon, the 6945, and uh, what he has to say about this particular word, uh, Kadesh. It says, this Hebrew adjective derives from 6942. It means a consecrated one, a devoted one, a sacred person. So the literal translation is to say, there shall be no female sacred person, or there shall be no male sacred person. Now, of course, we know that God says we're to be holy. And he told his nation many a time, you're to be holy as I am holy. So when he's saying that there shall be no female sacred person, he's not saying that, that women in Israel or that there shall be no male sacred person, that men in Israel are not to be sacred or that they're not to be holy. What he is saying is they're not to be uh, set apart in the same way as the idolatrous nations around them. They used to have high priests and high priestesses in their temple cult, uh, cultic worship situations. And the priest and the priestess would be available uh, in sexual um, escapades that were part of their worship service to their false deities. And we've talked about that kind of thing before uh, in terms of idol worship and the fertility cults and the, the kinds of things that they did in their worship experience. Uh, as we said, it's not like putting on a Hosanna integrity worship tape uh, and then and just putting different words to God or something. That's not what their worship was all about. Their, their uh, culture had a lot more to do with worshiping a god or a goddess of fertility. They wanted to ensure the fertility of their crops, their cattle, their land, uh, their wife, their children, whatever. And so by participating in sex with a high priest or a high priestess of this particular god or goddess, then that was supposed to ensure the fertility of their land, their crops, their sheep, their cattle, or whatever, and that was their belief. And so these uh, particular people, Kadesh or Kadesha, uh, meaning holy or sacred, are really the people that were the high priest or the priestesses in these, uh, in these cultic worship places, these cultic worship temples. And so therefore, it makes absolute sense for the word of God to come along and say, you shall not have a cultic female priestess among the daughters of Israel, nor shall you have a cultic male priest uh, in idolic, you know, um, idolatrous kind of uh, worship. Uh, among the sons of Israel. And that's literally what it's saying. Now, any other translation would make that very clear. We simply pick up the New American Standard and it says you shall have no male cult prostitutes. No male cult prostitutes. Nor shall you have female cult prostitutes. Pick up NIV, says something very similar in the same kind of thing. Pardon? Shrine prostitutes. I mean, it's a very clear translation, and it's a very good translation, and it's stemming from the word holy or sacred, understanding that it's something to do with religion and, and idolatry all in the same thing. So if your person's reading NIV, no problem. They don't, have to, they don't even have to deal with the looking at the Hebrew and trying to figure out what this word is all about. It, NIV has already translated it for you, a shrine cult prostitute or a cult prostitute, a New American Standard. But not so in King James, and uh, since so much of uh, uh, a lot of the hassle comes from uh, misunderstanding, and, and 1611 is a long time ago for people to be <laughs> carrying this baggage around and to, uh, to be therefore hammering people on the head with a misconception, because a sodomite 
uh, certainly implies one thing. And yet, if you really were to ask yourself, what does it mean to be a sodomite in light of the biblical word from the city of Sodom, then they would be having to translate this, you shall not have an inhospitable person among the sons of Israel or an inhospitable female person among the daughters of Israel, but that's not what they're getting at. They're getting at idolatrous worship. So um, I think that's pretty clear, and, uh, and yet uh, God thought it was important enough to let them know that the devoted ones, the sacred person, the cultic prostitutes, or the priest of Astarte uh, uh, were not to be among. In other words, you're not going to mix your religion. You're either going to serve God and worship God and worship God alone. The Lord our God is a jealous God. The Lord our God demands that we love him with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. And therefore, we're not going to be worshiping Astarte or Molech or Chemesh or any of these other gods uh, that the nations around them were worshiping and in whose worship they had these sexual uh, practices. There are... Uh, now, in spite of the fact that we looked at this word in Deuteronomy, which was part of their law code, and in spite of the fact that they were told, don't do this, what do you think they did? They did it anyway. They set up shrines to all these gods and goddesses of the nations around them. In fact, uh, I think it was last week, we looked at the fact that Solomon had set up those shrines. Um, you know, with the 1,000 uh, wives that he had, the 700 wives, the 300 concubines, and he set up gods in the and temples and altars to those gods and goddesses uh, in the city of Jerusalem, and we found out Josiah ripped down those temples and those shrines. Even within the temple of God itself were those, uh, those shrines set up. Astounding when the Lord said, don't do this. Don't be these kinds of folks. So it didn't take Israel too long to get off track, nor the southern kingdom of Judah once they had split. didn't take them too long to get off track. And even though the word told them, don't set up these cultic religions with these priests and priestesses, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. They did it anyway. And so the rest of the passages that we look at tonight are all the, the passages that deal with either they set up the, the Sodomite or the, the Kadesh, the high priest, the cultic priest, or the cultic priestess, or they tore down the, uh, the shrines and the, they drove out the Kadesh or the Kadesha uh, out of the land. So that's basically all this word is used at except for two other uh, things that we'll look at tonight. So you'll see that the word really, is say we wouldn't have to look at this at all except that King James calls them sodomites. In 1 Kings chapter 14, we pick up with another uh, reference to this word, Kadesh, shows up again. 1 Kings 14. Verse 22 through 24. Let me read this to you. And Judah, the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom, did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also, now King James again, there were also Sodomites. What do you think they really are? It's Kadesh. In the land, and they did according to all the abominations. Remember we said abominations was that word 8441 in Strong's, which has to do with idolatry. And so they did according to all the idolatry, the abominations of the nations, which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. See, God's really appalled here in this word. God is appalled because God cast out these nations that were serving these, uh, these demons, really, demonic forces that were set up as gods and goddesses. God's appalled because God said they were absolutely, um, you know, contrary to everything that God stood for, and God called the land unclean, and God said, you go and drive those people out. And now, God's people are setting up the very things that God uh, told them not to do. You know, really, this does have modern application, though, because there's so many things in the Word of God, besides idolatry, that the Word tells us to do or not to do. And we just turn right around. Even though God says, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, we just turn right around. We do it anyway. 
and God's just not pleased. Well, in this case, they went, you know, further than just us telling a, a lie. Or uh, they went ahead and they set up an altar, set up the whole caste system with the priests. The priestess started having sex in the temple, set up, it says, on, on every high hill. So how many high hills do you think uh, the nation of uh, Judah had? Well, every one of them, it says, there was another one, you know? So, I mean, there's quite a few priests and priestesses making their living uh, from these fertility cults. God's not pleased, as you can see. And so it says, they did according to all of the uh, uh, idolatrous ways of the nations which the Lord cast out. God goes to all the trouble of cleaning the land, getting rid of all the idolatry, and they go to all the trouble of saying, well, there's a high hill. We don't have anything on that one. Let's set up something there. And uh, there's another one over here. Let's set up another altar over there. They go to all that trouble to do that. So, um, so they're in trouble. They are in big trouble with God. We go... Uh, to the 15th chapter, verse 11 and verse 12. And lo and behold, God raises up a good king. And there are very few good kings in the Old Testament, very few. Uh, most of them are bad, in fact. But there's a few that are good, and this one by the name of Asa is a good king. So 1511 in the book of 1 Kings says, And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. And he took away the Kadesh, the Sodomites, King James says. As I said, we wouldn't be bothered looking at this word, except King James calls them Sodomites. They're not Sodomites. They're temple prostitutes. And he took away the temple prostitutes, the Kadesh, out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. And also Maaka, his mother, even her, he removed from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove. And Asa destroyed her idol and burnt it by the brook Kidron. Here's the uh, king, and the king's mother's got an idol right in her own home. And he has to knock down his own mother's idol and get rid of that, burn it. Uh, I mean, this thing is really pervasive in the society. People are just doing this all over the place. And, but the word said in 1511, Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. So all, obviously the cult prostitutes and the cult uh, priests were all removed then from the land. And God says, good, and good for you, Asa. And God gives Asa a, a star, gives him a little A that day. Now we go to chapter 22 in 1 Kings. And... Uh, there we find situation again. Same word again. See, we're looking at the same word. And if we wanted to know where can we find out for a fact every place this same word Kadesh looks up, that's where we go to that New Englishman's uh, Greek, or I mean Hebrew concordance, and lo and behold, look up 6945, and there it is, every, every single reference. And that's all we're looking at tonight is all the references that use this word. 1 Kings chapter 22. Verse 46. And the remnant of the Kadesh, or the cult prostitutes, or the shrine prostitutes, and the remnant, King James says, of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. Now we're looking at Jehoshaphat. We have to find that out by going up to verse 44. And Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might that he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Verse 46, where we picked up. And the remnant of the Kadesh, the remnant of the cultic prostitutes, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. And then... Uh, that's all that there is. Just that one reference there, the one time it's used. But again, King James says, and the rest, the remnant of the Sodomites, he took out of the land. Um, we have to go to 2 Kings chapter 23 to find another reference. And we're running out of references. There aren't many more on this one word. So chapter 23, we come across a king by the name of Josiah. Remember we said uh, last week that it was 300 and some years since Solomon had uh, built the, the uh, idols and the temples and the, the altars to the false gods before King Josiah comes along to rip them down. So in chapter 23, we, um, 
we come across, let me see here, where we want, we want verse, we want verse 7 is where the word is located, but um, I don't know, in King James it does, I don't think you have, I think you have to go back even further to find that this is actually Josiah that we're talking about, because I don't see his name listed here anywhere else. It just keeps talking about the king, the king, the king, but the king that we're talking about is Josiah. So verse 7 says, and he broke down the houses of 6945, the Sodomites, or Kadesh, literally, the cult prostitutes, that were by the house of the Lord. Now, isn't that interesting? So in other words, the cult prostitutes, the male cult prostitutes, they were right by the house of the Lord. In other words, next door setting up shop. You know, in other words, you can see them as kind of barkers and, you know, you, you, don't, you know don't bother going to the house of the God. We've got a special here today uh, for your, uh, ensure the fertility of your land, your cult, uh, your property, your crops, etc. Right next door. It's where this is set up. But, praise God, Josiah comes along and breaks down these cultic prostitute temples and drives out the... Uh, the priest that says he broke down the houses of the sodomites or the houses of the cultic or shrine prostitutes which were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the grove. The grove is the female Asherah, the, the female idol that they had and so they were always, the women were over there just always making new little outfits or doing something, making little pretty tapestries to put around it. I mean they made it look good, it looked good. To the uh, outward appearance, it looked good, but nonetheless, it was idolatry. So there's one more reference, and now I'm going to show you a, a one more reference, which is the last reference of this word, um, uh, of 6945 Kadesh, and you'll see that it doesn't even seem to apply to anything, but you have to go to the book of Job. And in chapter 36, see, without the uh, New Englishman's Hebrew concordance, you'd never find this word because you would know that you were looking for it. You'd look for Sodomite and you'd never find this. But here's this word again. Pardon? Job. Yes, the book of Job, chapter 36. And we're going to look at verse 14. And we'll find this word, Kadesh, again. But it picks up, the sentence picks up with verse 13, so we'll start there, but it's in verse 14 that we actually find the word Kadesh. So it says, But the hypocrites in heart heap up wrath, they cry not when he bindeth them, they die in youth, and their life is among the unclean. The word unclean is the word Kadesh. So uh, remember again, this word, though, means holy, or sacred person or devoted one. So really, now I was reading King James. So again, we're talking about the, the hypocrite in heart is who the topic of this subject is. They die in their youth and their life is among the Kadesh. In other words, their life's among the cult prostitutes. That's where they hang out. That's where you'll find them. So you're not going to find them in the house of God. You're going to find them in the house of uh, the cultic priests, in the house of the cultic priestesses. That's, that's what Job's simple... Uh, statement is here in the book of Job. Now the word for the female, uh, 6948 Kadesha, is used two other times and uh, just simply Hosea chapter 4 and then, well we'll look at that, verse 14. And again, remember, this is just simply the word sacred, but here we are, chapter 14, or chapter 4, verse 14. And uh, here's the word. It says, I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom, nor your spouses when they commit adultery, for themselves are separated with whores, and they sacrifice with harlots. Now this next word, harlots, this is the word there, 6948. It wasn't used prior to this. 
but it is now. And they sacrifice with harlots, or in other words, with female cult prostitutes. Sacrifice. They're making sacrifice with the female cult prostitutes. Therefore, the people that doth not understand shall fall. So that verse, because the other verse, uh, the other words before that, it said they are separated with whores, meaning now they're talking about adulterous situations. But then it goes on and says, and they sacrifice with the word harlot is the word female cult prostitute. I didn't know what some of the other versions say there. I don't know what it says in NIV or shrine prostitutes. We'll see because they still are continually, consistently translating that word um, to be what it actually is saying. Then we go, we see one more reference uh, for, the fe for the female and it's in Genesis 38 in the beginning of the Bible. And um, interestingly enough, this story just kind of is, is one time that the word is used kind of a, in a whole different situation, a whole different setting. But again, it's 6948. It's Kadesha, the female version. And uh, what this is interesting about this is this is the story of Judah and Tamar. And when Judah wants to find Tamar again in order to get back, his staff and his ring and to provide her with the goat that he promised her. He goes into town and he asks the question, where is the Kadesha? Now this is actually his, his daughter-in-law. And uh, you have to read that story. Read Genesis 38 to find out more about that story. But he's, he's calling his daughter-in-law. In other words, he assumed that his daughter-in-law uh, was a Kadesha. He did not know who she was. Her identity was hidden from him, and he thought that uh, he had found a Kadesha, a cultic prostitute, and, uh, which is intriguing because you don't usually get that out of the story, but that's the word that's used. And since there are other words for just a simple uh, prostitute or those kinds of things, surprisingly enough, this is what he thought, this is the word that he used about Tamar. So that's a, just an intriguing little thing. And with that, we have looked at every single last possible place that these words are used. Every, sim every single last possible place that they're used. There aren't any other places. Uh, and so how some people take that one word out of that one translation and then try to build a case that, you know, look what God did every time, you know, and that's where people get stories or, or sayings like, you know, God doesn't apologize, uh, if God doesn't, God will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah if he doesn't destroy San Francisco. Then, uh, uh, you know, I mean, they get that because they see that God was so displeased with these shrine prostitutes and therefore had always ripped them down, always destroyed them, always ruined them. But it never had anything to do, literally, with the, uh, what might be in modern vernacular translated as the word sodomite, or in a legal sense, the word sodomite, because it's a, such a, a really a, a pathetic, pathetic translation. Um, you know, not that uh, we can fault the translators in 1611. It's the word they used. They didn't have the things that we have today. They didn't know the things that we do know today. They didn't have the archaeology digs and finds that we have found. They, haven't, they weren't able to have uh, translated the hieroglyphics that we found. They didn't know what temple worship was all about in those days. And so, you know, utilizing what they did, they made their best guess. But we know a lot more today. And so that's why it's the modern translations New American Standard, for instance, and the NIV, etc., that look at this word and just call it what it is, a cultic shrine prostitute. So that's what we have for tonight. I know it's not much, and I said we wouldn't even have to look at it had it not been done that way. So let's just uh, close here tonight with prayer. Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for the opportunity to look at this word. And I ask you, Father, to quicken this word in our spirit so that we do know what it is we're looking at so that we can talk intelligibly and so that we can present the truth that sets people free. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And he said, take hold of my covenant and I will be your God. Take hold of my covenant and with the angels trod. If you my Sabbath 
and please me in your ways. I'll be your God and add